Welcome to the webcast, Stimulating Granulation Tissue in Wounds with Installation, a guide to wound bed preparation. This program is sponsored by North American Center for Continuing Medical Education and is supported by an educational grant from KCI. I am John Steinberg. I'm an associate professor at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital in Washington, D.C. I will be your presenter. Joining me today is Dr. Tom Wolvos from Scottsdale Healthcare Osborne Medical Center. My goal in speaking to you today is to briefly cover and provide an overview of this new therapy of installation for wounds. We use this readily in our hospital environment currently at Georgetown, and I want to share with you our thoughts on how it can be applied and perhaps some of the areas that we need to learn more about for the future uses. Please remember that to receive continuing education credit following the conclusion of this activity, each participant must complete the post-test and evaluation, which can be easily completed online for immediate receipt of credit at www.centerforhealingsolutions.com. Thank you again for your participation in this activity. Complex problems present frequently in the hospital environment in regards to wounds and infection. On this slide, you can see examples of necrotizing fasciitis, wet gangrene, and surgical dehiscence. Complex problems also present in the form of severe vascular disease. Here you can see a significant occlusion on an angiogram, you see a gangrenous limb, and you see an amputation. The fundamental principles of what we're going to outline are discussions on inpatient management, focusing on wound and medical management of those individuals, serial operative room debridement, targeted antibiotic therapy, and functional reconstruction and planning. The goals of wound treatment include perfusion and restoration of perfusion, converting a wound from dirty to clean and from chronic to acute, and to provide coverage and ultimately function to this individual through closure and covering of the defect and maintaining their active functional status. Debridement is a key element in regards to limb salvage and appropriate wound care and infection care. The purpose is, of course, to uh, deal with the acute infection and, uh, more importantly, in chronic wounds, to deal with the biofilm and the disruption of biofilm, removing that from the wound in its depth and the surface and then dealing with protein and cellular activation through this cycle of serial debridement. The action of debridement can be through serial debridement. In our institution, it's routine that a person with infection and a problem wound will go to the operating room every three days as an inpatient, and then the outpatient environment, of course, often doing weekly or more often debridement in the outpatient clinical environment. Our debridements, both in the clinic and especially in the operating room, are aggressive. These should be excisional debridements removing the wound margin, removing the senescent cells that lay in that wound margin, and appropriately ridding the wound of infection and biofilm. You can see here some examples of an operating room debridement. In this extremity, you can see gangrene, uh, the significant involvement and exposure of tissue loss involving the posterior aspect of the leg, extending down into bone. And you can see the appropriate surgical debridement is aggressive. It involves removal of the wound margins. It involves removal of the significant deep tissue necrosis, and oftentimes removal of a portion of the bony anatomy. In contrast, you can see the clinic debridement or the outpatient less severe debridement showing the difference between the recently debrided wound portion on the top and the not debrided portion on the bottom, showing how important it is to remove all of this fibrous necrotic tissue from the wound surface to allow that granular tissue to do its job in wound healing. When a patient presents with infection, it's important to distinguish between a mild infection that can be treated in the outpatient environment outside of the hospital, or a moderate or severe infection that requires hospitalization and likely urgent surgical procedure and parental antibiotics through team approach. In our clinical practice at Georgetown, a mild infection may involve cultures, usually involve imaging, and certainly involves aggressive local wound care. We're going to progress on to the appropriate antibiotic therapy and possibly topical antimicrobial to work as an adjunct. The antibiotics will be narrowed upon culture results, and the infection, uh, if persisting, will be admitted to the hospital. In the moderate to severe course on the right side of the slide, you can see that these patients are rapidly admitted to the hospital, oftentimes on the same day of their visit, if not through the emergency room. The parenteral antibiotics are done in complication with infectious disease and uh, they will have aggressive imaging modalities performed, rapid 
transportation to the operating room for incision and drainage and possible partial open amputation. And this will oftentimes involve the trigger point for us to involve the installation negative pressure wound therapy. Our algorithm for inpatient care of an infected wound, uh, particularly an infected diabetic foot wound, uh, is outlined for you here. You can see that uh, upon admission, these patients are taken for their operating room visit for aggressive debridement, aggressive deep culturing and biopsying, uh, and if necessary, a partial open amputation. It's rare for us to close an infected wound on operating room visit number one. We will generally perform a second debridement, often perform a third debridement, and final closure. In between these operative treatments, uh, we have found negative pressure wound therapy with installation to be a significant adjunct uh, in our wound maintenance between surgical procedures. Uh, we are able to actively cleanse uh, the wound. We are able to uh, decrease our number of trips to the operating room and ultimately our length of stay through aggressive use of this therapy. The VAC Ulta therapy system uh, has uh, four key components. Uh, you can see outlined here for you here. The installation of solution, which we'll speak more of here in a few moments. The dwell, or the time with which that solution is left to soak on the surface of the wound. The uh, third is the evacuation of the solution that's removed out through the drainage tubing portal. And then finally, the application uh, of negative pressure therapy, which uh, takes up the majority of that cycle. Uh, for example, the negative pressure therapy will oftentimes be for several hours, while the dwell time and installation will be just for a few minutes. Here you can see a clinical example of uh, utilization uh, in the operating room with the VAC Ulta therapy system. Uh, the tubing uh, and the uh, uh, cartridges are slightly different. Uh, than using negative pressure therapy alone, but have been made uh, quite user-friendly uh, to be delivered to the patient in an efficient and effective manner uh, in the, with similar machinery that we're used to using for standard negative pressure wound therapy. You can see uh, on the right side of the uh, machine itself is the standard uh, cartridge and collection uh, for the uh, uh, solution of the wound drainage and also the installation. Uh, uh, fluid that are removed from the wound. In the center circle, you see the upside down uh, container, which contains the uh, tubing that connect into the device so that the appropriate installation uh, solution can be uh, placed into the wound site through uh, the tubing uh, that has both an ingress and an egress that you can see on the left-hand portion of the slide showing the circle uh, over the, uh, the uh, negative pressure dressing therapy at the actual site of installation. Uh, the clinical literature has uh, shown us that uh, over and over again that negative pressure wound therapy is well established as an adjunctive wound healing modality. Negative pressure wound therapy with installation has been reported in the literature for use in infected and contaminated wounds, but no robust studies examining the efficacy of negative pressure wound therapy with installation on infected or contaminated wounds has yet been published. There is a significant body of literature uh, that helps guide our decision-making and our prescription therapy uh, for negative pressure wound therapy. In fact, uh, over 1,500 index publications and 59 randomized controlled trials uh, have outlined the utility of negative pressure wound therapy in a numerous uh, modalities and settings uh, for wound challenges. Negative pressure wound therapy with installation, in contrast, uh, has just 30 index publications, uh, no randomized controlled trials, uh, but we are aggressively pursuing this data both at our institution and many others uh, because of what we feel to be a significant clinical importance of this therapy. Case studies we're going to look at now uh, will help to outline some of our early experiences that we've had at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital in using installation therapy in some of our most challenging infection cases and amputation cases. Case number one is a 58-year-old gentleman uh, with diabetes, and you can see significant forefoot abscess with cellulitis extending up to the midfoot uh, as outlined uh, both plantarly and dorsally. You can see significant concern for the forefoot uh, with immediate uh, discussion with the patient about a likely uh, partial limb loss, if not total limb loss, given the aggressiveness of this infection. The initial OR debridement for this individual involved aggressive uh, incision and drainage with early planning uh, and decision-making uh, partially guided by the fact that this patient may require a transmetatarsal amputation uh, 
and therefore trying to fashion our skin incisions and our approach to not only appropriately decompress the infection uh, and remove any necrotic uh, tissue, uh, but also to plan for the likelihood that we're going to be trying to create flaps of a dorsal and plantar nature to anatomically close this foot. You can see photos here after the second operating room debridement, and you can see uh, mostly granular tissue now uh, with uh, the infection necessitating aggressive incision and drainage, both plantar and dorsal, as well as amputation of a portion of the first and second ray. In pursuing negative pressure wound therapy with insulation for this patient uh, as we stage towards an ultimate uh, closure procedure or definitive functional amputation, uh, you can see the uh, foam uh, and drape applied uh, through the uh, wound site to cover all surfaces uh, of the wound, including bone, including tendon, uh, so that the installation uh, can be delivered to all surfaces of the wound to maintain a clean environment. The uh, uh, remaining portion of the drape is placed over the foam to create a complete uh, airtight seal, and then the specialized tubing is connected uh, which allows for both the ingress and the egress of fluid, uh, as well as the application of negative pressure wound therapy through the single site. As you can see here, I'm now connecting the patient to the actual device uh, with the appropriate insulation uh, solution selected, and then the beginning of therapy where we will test the amount of fluid that can be safely and appropriately instilled into this wound site to get the best uh, clinical effect. On return to the operating room, you can see final debridement and performance of the transmetatarsal amputation. We have healthy granular tissue. This wound has uh, moved forward now uh, with the appropriate debridement and use of the installation therapy and negative pressure wound therapy such that we are able to preserve these dorsal and plantar flaps uh, and maintain a granular tissue and a healthy environment around the cut segments of the metatarsals. You can see here three weeks uh, post-closure small skin graft was utilized to, uh, to cover the uh, defect that was left from the significant tissue loss, the dorsal aspect of the TMA, and these uh, flaps were able to cover the deep tissues very well with excellent uh, padding and expect a good long functional outturn, outcome uh, for this patient. Case number two is a 54-year-old male with type 2 diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, and peripheral sensory neuropathy. The patient presented with cellulitis, foot abscess with osteomyelitis, the first metatarsal head, and the proximal phalanx of the hallux. Uh, clearly, you can see from these clinical pictures that significant infection and tissue loss was present at the time of the initial surgical debridement, necessitating an aggressive surgical approach with amputation of a portion of the first ray. We preserved these tissue flaps and progressed towards closure uh, with utilization, again, uh, at the uh, interface between operative debridements with use of the negative pressure therapy with installation. Case number three is a 59-year-old male with type 2 diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, and sensory neuropathy, presented also with cellulitis, abscess, and osteomyelitis of the proximal and distal phalanx of the right hallux. Uh, this was determined on radiographic and clinical examination with a wound site that probed to bone, necessitating amputation involving a fillet of the hallux, so we preserved as much of those soft tissues as possible on the initial incision and drainage for later closure. We did four days of negative pressure wound therapy with installation and then progressed on to closure. You can see our progress clinically as outlined by the slides. Case number four is a 47-year-old male with type 2 diabetes, peripheral neuropathy, and a healed prior transmetatarsal amputation. The patient presented with cellulitis, aggressive abscess, and a chronic wound sub-fifth metatarsal with exposed bone. The concern with this uh, patient was the existing prior amputation, the desire to prevent a complete limb loss, and you can see the location of the wound in a significant weight-bearing position. So aggressive incision and drainage was performed. We used two days of negative pressure wound therapy with installation and then progressed on to a biologic uh, called Integra uh, where we applied this collagen-based matrix to the wound and were able to achieve ultimate healing and limb preservation. Case number five is a 66-year-old male with alcohol-induced peripheral neuropathy and an ulcer of a one-year duration. The patient presented uh, to our institution with cellulitis, abscess, and osteomyelitis, which is a common theme for these patients with their infection. The initial incision and drainage was followed by two days of negative pressure wound therapy and ultimately closure. You can see a common theme in these cases where we are doing aggressive surgical debridement early on in the clinical case and following that with negative pressure wound therapy so that we can facilitate and possibly make the second trip to the OR their last trip to the OR and have healthy tissues that we can actually close and reconstruct 
or possibly even graft over. Case number six is a 52-year-old female with poorly controlled diabetes, presents to the hospital on transfer with cellulitis, abscess, and exposed tendons. You can see her photos here showing significant necrosis, already existing partial tissue loss of the forefoot, and a wound that extends not only at the dorsal and distal aspect of the forefoot, but into the plantar and midfoot arch. Uh, you can see a significant conversion after aggressive surgical debridement and use of uh, negative pressure wound therapy that uh, when we come back for our second look at this individual uh, with, um, after two days of installation, we find a dramatic improvement in the wound site with the wound now showing significant granulation. We're able to repeat our debridement, continue the negative pressure wound therapy with installation for another three days, and then our final uh, trip back to the offering room, we indeed use the uh, soft tissues of the hallux as a fillet and remove the bony structures, progressing to a completed midfoot amputation and applying uh, the biologic tissue Integra uh, to cover the gap. Uh, on the first trip to the operating room, the posterior ribbon cultures were positive for streptococcus and pseudomonas. On the second trip to the operating room, the posterior ribbon cultures were positive only for streptococcus. And on the final trip to the operating room, we achieved negative cultures uh, in our free debridement. Uh, this is ultimately what we're looking for to be the decision point of uh, closing a challenging diabetic foot infection, such as what you can see here. We want negative cultures, and we feel that installation therapy assists us in getting to that point quicker and perhaps with less trips to the operating room. The application of splitting the skin graft was the ultimate outcome for this patient after we had an appropriate biologic tissue base and we had completed the amputation. Uh, you can see photos here now of this patient with a healed functional midfoot amputation uh, in what was a, certainly a threatened limb. Uh, this uh, technology of installation and utilization for surgical debridement in infected wounds certainly can be applied in numerous uh, anatomic sites. Uh, you can see here happens to be a case from some of our plastic surgery colleagues who were using this in an elbow uh, where there was infected hardware, concern for deep tissue and bone, a lot of tissue loss, and use of negative pressure therapy with installation was assistance. You can see Achilles wounds with significant disruption from Achilles repair where the suture uh, of a braided nature can oftentimes become infected uh, and must all be removed, leaving a significant tissue gap uh, and uh, liquefying much of the tendon, uh, which requires reconstruction. But before reconstruction can be performed, we need a granular healthy tissue base in order to perform that. Uh, our group uh, uh, worked um, uh, to publish in Plastics and Reconstructive Surgery uh, in 2014 uh, the uh, article, uh, The Impact of Negative Pressure Wound Therapy with Installation Compared with Standard Negative Pressure Wound Therapy, a Retrospective Historical Cohort Controlled Study. This study uh, cheaply uh, pub uh, published data regarding our uh, experience with a six-minute dwell time of the installation solution, followed by three and a half hours of negative pressure wound therapy, in contrast to a 20-minute dwell time for the solution, followed by two hours of negative pressure wound therapy. The methods we used to perform the study included retrospectively analyzed consecutive patients with historical control. The data was gathered from inpatient charts from a single institution at our hospital, at Star Georgetown University Hospital in Washington, D.C. There were four surgeons, two plastic surgeons, and two podiatric surgeons. 142 patients uh, were uh, received uh, uh, for the uh, Infovac uh, and the VAC Ulta therapy for the same time period. The device uh, involved negative pressure therapy, uh, so VAC Ulta system compared with the VAC Veriflow system, all at 125 millimeters of continuous negative pressure therapy. In contrast, the 3.5 hours versus two hours of negative pressure wound therapy were compared. The installation group used Prontosan, which is a polyhexanide plus betaine, and used a six versus 20 minute soak or dwell time. The volume varied depending on wound size and when we felt that the foam was visibly saturated on the test dose of the installation. Admission criteria included signs and symptoms of infection confirmed with white blood cell count and or qualitative cultures from the wound site. The discharge criteria were cleared infection confirmed by white blood cell count and or qualitative cultures from the wound site. The surgical technique involved debridement, use of scalpel, sharp instrumentation, curettes, hydrosurgical debridement, scissors, and rongeur. And the irrigation uh, was pulsatile irrigation performed in the operating room utilizing three liters of normal saline at the time of wound debridement. The independent variables that we looked at on OR visit number one looked at post-debridement qualitative cultures, 
uh, versus OR visit number two, pre-debridement cultures obtained from the wound site. We looked at the number of operating room visits. We looked at the length of hospital stay, the percent of closure prior to discharge from the hospital, and the number of days to closure from the time of admission. The qualitative bacterial cultures uh, include a culture taken from the deepest margin of the wound or the infected site of the wound. The results converted to normal, excuse me, the results were converted to nominal data uh, where no growth equaled a one value, scant growth equaled a two value, and so on to the point of heavy growth equaling a five number value. If the wound was polymicrobial, then the sum of the nominal data were averaged for each patient. You can see here uh, the demographic information in comparing the negative pressure wound therapy control group to the negative pressure wound therapy with installation six minute group and the negative pressure wound therapy with installation 20 minute group. We found uh, uh, equal populations in regards to age, sex, race, and comorbidities for these patient populations. Looking at wound cause and anatomical location, also very similar data in comparing the three groups of the control group the six-minute group and the 20-minute dwell group time when comparing the primary cause of the wound, looking primarily at uh, wounds that involved infection, obviously, the ischemic, neuropathic, decubitus wounds, and surgical wounds that became infected, and the anatomic locations uh, also uh, being fairly similar for these individuals from forefoot uh, to other anatomic locations. Table three, uh, looking at outcomes for these individuals, uh, looks, again, comparing the control group of NPWT six-minute installation group versus the 20-minute installation group. And what was significant was looking at the number of OR visits for these individuals, where we found the control group was an average value of three versus the six-minute and 20-minute installation groups were 2.4 and 2.6, respectively. We also found significant change in regards to the length of hospital stay in these individuals from 14.92 days down to 11.9 and 11.4 days. The study limitations, uh, this certainly was not a prospective or randomized trial. We used a historical control from our own group at the hospital. We used qualitative cultures, not quantitative cultures. This was non-standardized volume of installate uh, as dictated by the wound size. And the length of hospital stay uh, had significant other variables that were, in general, not accounted for. Uh, this is an article uh, by uh, uh, Lessing et al. Uh, published in 2013, looking at negative pressure wound therapy versus negative pressure wound therapy with insulation, uh, looking at granulation tissue in the porcine model. You can see here uh, there are uh, examples in figure four of continuous negative pressure wound therapy, intermittent negative pressure wound therapy, dynamic negative pressure wound therapy, and then the negative pressure wound therapy with insulation using saline showed a significant increase in thickness for granulation tissue in their wound model. Uh, this was, again, a porcine uh, excisional wound. So now we'd like to look at the practical application uh, of negative pressure wound therapy with insulation. So in 2013, uh, we worked together with an international consensus group to publish uh, this uh, negative pressure wound therapy with insulation international consensus guidelines. The panelists uh, for this international group uh, involved, as you can see on the left-hand side, uh, four of us from Georgetown from both plastic surgery and podiatric surgery, in addition to Dr. Lerner and Dr. Willey from Germany, uh, Dr. Lavery from Dallas uh, in the uh, Department of Plastic Surgery at UT Southwestern, and Tom Bovos, uh, Chief of Surgery, uh, and my uh, co-moderator here for this uh, webcast from Scottsdale Osborne uh, Healthcare Medical Center. Uh, in addition, uh, we were joined uh, by uh, Professor uh, Dennis Orgill from Harvard Medical School, uh, Alan Gabriel uh, from the uh, Plastics and Maxillofacial Surgery Division at Southwestern Washington Medical Center in Vancouver, uh, William Ennis uh, from the University of Illinois at Chicago uh, in uh, the surgery department, uh, John Lantis uh, from Columbia University, and Gregory Schultz from the University of Florida in the uh, Wound Research Division. The process that we used to develop a, a consensus uh, was uh, obviously, as I mentioned, the appropriate panel and selection of the panelists and having a physical meeting of these panelists, uh, followed by a significant survey tool that was utilized with the survey responses tallied and comments appropriately evaluated. Uh, a draft manuscript was circulated with additional significant comments and edits made uh, throughout the group and then appropriate submission of a manuscript. Uh, 
There are nine uh, consensus statements that uh, resulted from this group, uh, the first of which uh, is listed here as statement number one. Negative pressure wound therapy with insulation can be used as an adjunctive therapy after being appropriately treated and evaluated in the following wound types. Uh, this uh, wound type is broad. You can see here we have listed 10 wound types uh, ranging from acutely and chronically infected wounds to diabetic, traumatic, decubitus wound down to uh, the fact of painful and bridging uh, staged amputation wounds. There was agreement that all wounds should be appropriately treated and evaluated and that it should not be used, negative pressure wound therapy with insulation, as a sole modality to treat infection. Consensus statement number two states that negative pressure wound therapy with insulation does not replace debridement of the acutely infected, chronically infected, or contaminated wound. So clearly, negative pressure wound therapy with insulation is not a debridement modality. It can be used as a bridge between debridements, as described in the cases earlier, and it can serve to prepare the wound bed for closure or grafting. Consensus statement number three states that the following are appropriate insulation solutions that can be used with negative pressure wound therapy with insulation. Lavacept, which is a polyhexanide 0.04%, Prontosan, which is a polyhexanide plus betaine, and finally, Microsin or Dermosin. The other solutions that were discussed uh, included acetic acid, dilute iodine, dilute Dakin solution, and antibiotics as alone, alone, as well as some combinations, including normal saline and a silver nitrate solution. It is important to evaluate the unique properties of insulation solution, including the potential for toxicity of the wound, the activity that it will have within the wound, the availability of the uh, installation modality solution, and the cost of the solution. Consensus statement number four states that an appropriate range of installation dwell time is 10 to 20 minutes. Uh, again, this is expert opinion and early clinical use opinion, but there was strong agreement amongst the international consensus panel that the appropriate dwell time was in the range of 10 to 20 minutes. Uh, clearly, a balance must be struck between the length of dwell time and the length of time in which the negative pressure is applied. There is no evidence that evaluates the length of dwell and its relationship to antimicrobial activity when a solution is used in combination with negative pressure wound therapy. Consensus statement number five states that an appropriate volume of installation solution is used until the foam is visibly saturated. What we're saying here is that essentially uh, during that initial test dose, you should uh, gauge the amount of installation to place in for dwelling based on the amount of solution it takes to see visible saturation of the foam under the plastic drape material. The ideal volume solution is elusive due to the fact that wound size, wound shape, and wound anatomy vary and are complicated by tunneling and irregular dimensions. Too much solution may cause difficulty in maintaining a seal with the occlusive dressing that could also lead to maceration of the surrounding skin edges and too little solution will not allow enough solution to actually bathe the entire wound surface and certainly provides insufficient coverage. Consensus statement number six states that an appropriate negative pressure time phase is one to 2.5 hours. Again, this is expert panelist and opinion in early clinical use. Negative pressure wound therapy alone may have significant inhibitory impact on biofilm. The combination of negative pressure wound therapy with insulation uh, using a solution seems to have an additive antimicrobial effect in our experience, and for large wounds, short negative pressure times can lead to frequent exchanging of the solution, emptying container, uh, and the fact of just the logistics of pumping in a lot of fluid and pumping out a lot of fluid uh, will be a significant burden to the nurses uh, and perhaps uh, resources for the hospital. Consensus statement seven is that an appropriate negative pressure wound therapy with insulation pressure setting is negative 125 millimeters of mercury and negative 150 millimeters of mercury. Uh, Moriquaz uh, et al. suggested that both pressures lower and higher than 125 result in a significant decrease in formation of granulation tissue. Uh, 125 is generally the target uh, that we shoot for. We have found on occasion it is helpful to increase the amount of negative pressure uh, onto the wound site in the case of, neg in the case of installation uh, for the sake of, of completely removing the installate solution and maintaining an appropriate seal for these individuals. Uh, consensus statement number eight states that an appropriate setting for negative pressure is continuous, not intermittent. Uh, this is mostly from just a practical standpoint. 
that uh, uh, the installation solution itself already complicates the uh, seal of the uh, drape to the skin. And if we were to allow uh, additional cycling through a, a intermittent cycle of negative pressure wound therapy, we would be further stressing the seal. Uh, and this is just from a practical standpoint of maintaining a continuous negative pressure therapy in the setting of installation. Finally, consensus statement number nine uh, states that an exact minimum and maximum duration of negative pressure wound therapy is variable. Uh, there is no absolute minimum or maximum duration uh, for the use of uh, NPWTI. Uh, the duration of negative pressure wound therapy with insulation is dependent on factors such as wound quality and the surgical plan. And indefinite use of negative pressure wound therapy with insulation is not clinically or economically prudent. Uh, this goes along in general uh, with our negative pressure wound therapy uh, clinical thought process of you should have a clear target in mind when you prescribe this therapy, and there should be an endpoint at which you feel that you have accomplished those goals and will move on to the next phase. Uh, we feel that it's pretty clear using negative pressure wound therapy with insulation that your continuous goal is eventual coverage and closure of the wound site, uh, whether it be by grafting or primary closure through surgery. Uh, so we are we are uh, consistently seeking that point at which we can stop negative pressure wound therapy and move to a final wound closure phase in the operating room. There are significant limitations to the consensus statements that I have just listed uh, for you previously. Uh, clearly, this is expert opinion and is low on the hierarchy of evidence-based medicine. Uh, a true Delphi method was not completely utilized in the consensus statements. Relatively small number of experts were on our panel as listed previously. There is a paucity of evidence to support the statements. Uh, the consensus statements only provide preliminary guidelines from which we hope that the clinical community uh, will uh, branch out uh, and continue to uh, not only have clinical success, but publish those successes and share uh, the, uh, the data so that we can all uh, practice uh, further evidence in this area. And as the body of evidence grows, uh, then these guidelines will certainly require uh, likely modification. In conclusion, uh, I want to thank you all for joining us on this webcast. And uh, I want to point out uh, some, some final learning points that I hope you were able to gain in this discussion. Uh, first is that uh, wound bed preparation is a multi-step process that involves multiple uh, points within uh, the uh, medical and surgical arena. What we're discussing with you now being the, the role of negative pressure wound therapy with insulation as part of that multi-step process. But again, keeping in mind that you have to have a clear endpoint in mind when you begin a therapy such as installation therapy. We want to maximize perfusion, reduce bacterial contamination, and have a functional reconstructive plan uh, for these wounds and infected wounds that we are uh, undergoing treatment for. Uh, clearly, negative pressure wound therapy with insulation shows promise as an adjunct of treatment for the acutely infected wound that requires hospital admission. We are in the early stages of understanding the proper use of this technology and publishing uh, on its successes, and then potentially, uh, both clinically and economically, uh, this can be a significant advance for the hospital environment. Uh, and we, we believe uh, that this device not only helps us to decrease potentially length of stay and number of trips to the operating room, but will increase the thickness of granulation tissue and provide uh, more functional outcomes in our partial foot amputations and wound closures. I would like to thank you uh, for your attention. Uh, this concludes my portion of the presentation. I will now turn things over to Dr. Wolvos to begin his presentation. Thank you, Dr. Steinberg. My goal in speaking to you today is to evaluate the effectiveness of negative pressure wound therapy in inducing wound bed granulation tissue in patients with wounds. To review the role of wound cleansing and wound bed preparation, comparing cleansing techniques and solutions, and review the clinical evidence supporting the use of negative pressure wound therapy with insulation in managing a variety of wound types. Wound bed preparation is the management of a wound in order to accelerate endogenous healing or to facilitate the effectiveness of other therapeutic measures. The overall goal of wound bed preparation is to create an optimal wound healing environment by producing a wound bed that is well vascularized stable, and with little or no exudate. The TIME acronym was developed over 10 years ago by an international group of wound healing experts to provide an uh, approach to wound bed preparation. Looking at the acronym TIME, 
T stands for tissue and a description of whether the tissue is non-viable or deficient. I, infection or inflammation. M, moisture balance. And E, the edge of the wound with non-advancing epithelialization or the presence of undermining. Ten years later, this group examined how new data and evidence uh, generated in the decade from the original article affected the original time concepts. Uh, and what was learned in the last 10 years uh, concerning tissue was a recognition of the value of repetitive and maintenance debridement and cleansing of the wound. Infection and inflammation, recognition of the importance of biofilms in uh, wounds and the concept of a continuum of bacterial where you have small numbers in a wound that may be contaminated to increasing numbers with colonization of the wound and eventual uh, invasive infection. Moisture. A variety of dressings have been developed that regulate moisture balance and protect the peri wound skin from becoming macerated. An edge of the wound investigation of several treatment modalities to improve epithelialization of the wound. Many factors are important in wound bed preparation, and I'm going to concentrate on moisture balance, edema, and fluid management. In 1962, George Winter published an article showing epithelialization of superficial wounds in the skin of young pigs and saw that there was improvement in a moist wound healing environment. This is a concept which has been very slow to be accepted. Forty years later, Lisa Ovington wrote a classic article, Hanging Wet to Dry, Dressings Out to Dry. And even today, it's uh, in, in impressive the number of patients who still think that you should let a wound dry out uh, and be open to air. And it's important to explain to these people that wounds feel better if they're kept in a moist wound healing environment. Effectiveness of negative pressure wound therapy in inducing granulation tissue. The original study done by Louis Argenta uh, looked at the form, formation of granulation tissue in wounds treated with negative pressure wound therapy. And there was about a 62 to 63% increase in the amount of granulation tissue in wounds treated with uh, negative pressure wound therapy compared to uh, controls. The amount of granulation tissue increased from 63% when the negative pressure was applied continuously to over 100%, about 103% when negative pressure was applied intermittently on for five minutes, off for two minutes. A more recent study published in 2011 showed that a foam-based negative pressure wound therapy system could improve the quality of the wound bed with a significant increase in beefy red granulation tissue, and this was statistically significant. Chris Lessing published an article showing that an increase in granulation tissue was seen at seven days in a non-infected, full-thickness pig model when a less hydrophobic foam was used. The new foam was less hydrophobic, and you can see distributed more fluid uh, compared to the original open-celled reticulated foam. At seven days, there was a 43% increase in granulation tissue thickness with the new foam, which was less hydrophobic, and this was statistically significant. The role of wound cleansing. Comparison of techniques and solutions. Wound irrigations. The goal of a wound irrigation is to remove debris and bacteria from the wound while minimizing injury to the normal tissue in the area around the wound. It appears that the delivery pressure of the wound irrigation seems to be an important factor in accomplishing this goal. A delivery pressure of 5 to 10 pounds per square inch, or PSI, has been an accepted range to remove debris and bacteria from wounds while minimizing damage to the normal tissues. It's not uncommon to see uh, wound care providers using a bulb syringe and irrigating uh, wounds like this. 
how much pressure is generated in this type of system. You can see that pouring liquid from a bottle or using a bulb syringe delivers virtually uh, a little or no pressure at all. A piston syringe can deliver 8 psi in the acceptable range, and more pulsating jet lavage devices can deliver much more. It has been shown that a 35 cc syringe and 19 gauge needle can deliver a pressure of 8 psi. I think it's important to remember that you should treat the wound at dressing changes. Don't just remove the old dressing and place a new dressing on the wound, but again, using a very simple system which would be easy to find uh, in any care setting can help clean the wound. A 35 cc syringe and 19 gauge needle has been shown to de decrease infection, induration, and bacterial counts compared to a low pressure aseptal syringe. Using insulation therapy combined with negative pressure wound therapy. Negative pressure wound therapy with installation combines negative pressure wound therapy with automated installation of topical wound irrigation solutions and suspensions. This can be done in two ways, continuously with the negative pressure applied or in an intermittent fashion when the fluid is instilled while the negative pressure is off. In a continuous system, the fluid is inaccessible to areas of tunneling and undermining because these are pulled together by the negative pressure. As the negative pressure is continuously being applied during the installation. In an intermittent system, the fluid reaches the areas of tunneling and undermine, undermining when instilled in an intermittent insulation system because the suction is turned off and the tissue expands. If you look at slide F, you can see that in this auger-based model, the solution reach, reaches the area of tunneling in the upper right side. In a continuous system, when suction is applied, this tissue is pulled together, and you can see in slide C that it is no longer accessible to that fluid. Negative pressure wound therapy with insulation was described in 1993 by Dr. Wim Fleshman in his vacuum sealing article talking about uh, insulation therapy. Original negative pressure wound therapy with insulation system was described in this article in 2004 in a revised system uh, in a chapter in surgical wound healing and management, September 2012. What wound types are appropriate for use with negative pressure wound therapy with installation? A number of different wound types have uh, been reported to be used uh, successfully with negative pressure wound therapy with installation. This includes wounds with invasive infection or extensive biofilm, contaminated wounds or wounds at a high risk of becoming infected. Negative pressure wound therapy with installation has been shown to jumpstart wounds that have stalled with conservative wound therapy or wounds that have stalled after a trial of traditional negative pressure wound therapy. Appropriate wounds include complex donotomy wounds with infection, wounds with a very viscous exudate to decrease the viscosity of the wound, compound or open fractures to prevent the development of wound infection or osteomyelitis, necrotizing fasciitis, large areas of exposed exposed bone in the wound so as not to dry out the uh, bone with traditional negative pressure wound therapy, wounds with exposed synthetic mesh, either monofilament or biologic, wounds that are at an increased risk of needing a major amputation unless there's a drastic improvement due to the nature of the wound and associated medical comorbidities of the patient. Diabetic foot ulcers, post-operative diabetic foot ulcers with a question of incomplete debridement or large areas of post-debridement exposed bone or joint as an alternative to antibiotic impregnated beads in infected orthopedic wounds, painful wounds. Glute lidocaine is extremely effective in relieving the pain that may be associated with the use of negative pressure wound therapy 
and infected wounds with a foreign body in place. A case study to help illustrate the use of negative pressure wound therapy with insulation is included. This is a 70-year-old gentleman who has osteomyelitis of his left foot. He recently had undergone a transmetatarsal amputation, had significant peripheral vascular disease, which was not able to be improved. He was transferred to our long-term acute care facility. A blown knee amputation was recommended, but it was felt that the use of negative pressure wound therapy with insulation combined with hyperbaric oxygen therapy may allow healing of the wound and saving his leg. Negative pressure wound therapy with insulation dressing was in place. Uh, the fluid instilled was a hypochlorous acid-based solution. After two and a half weeks of negative pressure wound therapy with insulation, the wound was now clean, healthy, and granulating. He underwent a split thickness skin graft, which was bolstered with traditional negative pressure wound therapy. The wound went on to heal, and at a one-year follow-up had remained healthy and healed. The science insulation therapy. Dr. Alan Gabriel published an article looking at a comparison of negative pressure wound therapy with insulation with moist wound healing. What he saw was that compared to standard moist wound healing using negative pressure with insulation, the, were, there were fewer number of treatment days, less time to clear a clinical infection, less time to wound closure, and less total days in the hospital. Is negative pressure wound therapy with insulation better than traditional negative pressure wound therapy? There is evidence that insulation and normal saline alone may be more effective than traditional negative pressure wound therapy. Amy McNulty and her group looked at a non-infected porcine full thickness wound model. Negative pressure wound therapy instilled with insulation using normal saline was instilled every six hours. The data suggests that insulation therapy with normal saline may lead to wound fill with higher quality granulation tissue composed of increased collagen compared to traditional negative pressure wound therapy alone. In a study done by Chris Lessing, you can see on the left that the granulation tissue thickness had increased uh, in a negative pressure therapy with insulation system using a less hydrophobic foam. Histologically on the right, you can see that the thickness is made up of high quality granulation tissue. Some people argue that the reason you see better granulation tissue is simply that you are going from a continuous to an intermittent uh, negative pressure system, which has been shown to increase the granulation tissue. A study by Chris Lessing showed that this was more than just the effect of going from uh, continuous to intermittent therapy. The effect, again, is greater than the result of intermittent therapy alone. You can see that there is statistically significant greater rate of wound fill when you compare intermittent negative pressure wound therapy to negative pressure wound therapy with saline. And this is statistically significant. The results in patients confirm these in vitro observations. A multi-center study done in France led by Dr. Luc Tiat looked at their experience with negative pressure wound therapy and installation of normal saline. They had 131 patients with 131 wounds. 80% of the wounds were open fractures, infected hematomas, or pressure ulcers of the perineum and heel. They achieved 98% closure after an average of 13 days of negative pressure with insulation and normal saline. 57% were closed by skin grafts, 24% delayed primary closure, and 17% by flaps. Their patient experience confirms the in vitro data that recently was presented. Normal saline versus the use of an antiseptic solution. Dr. Greg Schultz at the U University of Florida has a 
a Pseudomonas biofilm model and use this model to look at the effect of various antiseptic solutions uh, in treating the Pseudomonas biofilm. They took sterile pig skin explants and inoculated the explants with Pseudomonas to create the biofilm. Several different solutions were used in a negative pressure with insulation system to see the effect on the biofilms. The biofilms were then biopsied to see the effect of each instilled flu uh, fluid on the biofilm. You can see that with saline, uh, Pseudomonas biofilm bacteria are still present. For example, with the use of 10% povidone iodine, uh, there is a significant decrease in the bacteria present. They looked at the effect of six cycles of negative pressure wound therapy with insulation of various solutions on their pseudomonas biofilm in pigskin explant product. You can see looking at the third bar from the left, the uh, decrease in colony forming units with normal saline alone. And you can see that there are numerous solutions which have statistically significant decrease in the colony forming units of the biofilm. Which antimicrobial solution? Publications have shown uh, different concentrations of wounds that can be used with negative pressure therapy with installation, and which one of these solutions uh, can be combined with lidocaine without inactivation of the solution. With normal saline installations, it has been shown, again, to be better than traditional negative pressure therapy alone, and there's no toxicity of the tissues with normal saline. On the negative side, there are no antimicrobial properties, and normal saline can create a moist environment that may encourage the development of yeast in the wound. Contrasting with antimicrobial insulations, positives are that they can decrease levels of infection and biofilm in the wound and can prevent bacterial growth and yeast in the wound. Negatively, theoretically, there may be toxicity to the normal tissues of the solution and it may encourage the development of resistant organisms. Generally, the concentrations of antimicrobials used are so high that more likely it will lead to cell death than to development of resistant organisms. An international panel of experts in the use of negative pressure wound therapy with installation was convened to make recommendations on different aspects of this therapy. Looking at the types of solutions used with installation therapy, there was greater than 80% agreement from this international expert consensus panel on three solutions. Prontosan, which is polyhexanide, 0.1%, and the betaine surfactant. Microsin or dermosin in some markets, which is a hypochlorous acid-based solution. And Lavacept, polyhexanide, 0.04%, which is available only in Germany. Polyhexanide, 0.04% is antimicrobial, can kill bacteria with little effect on normal cells. It has a slower onset of action and prolonged lasting effects. Prontosan combines 0.1% polyhexanide with the surfactant betaine, which may be better at breaking apart biofilms. Hypochlorous acid-based solutions, microsin or dermosin in some markets, has broad antimicrobial activity, low toxicity to normal tissue, minimal side effects, and appears to have a different mechanism of action than Dakin's, which is sodium hypochlorite, as some bacteria that are resistant to Dakin's are killed with microsin. Further clinical experiences and controlled randomized trials will be needed to determine the effectiveness of negative pressure wound therapy with installation. A clinician should consider installation of normal saline for wounds with a low risk of infection, a very viscous exudate, or to jumpstart a stalled wound. <laughs>
consideration of an antiseptic solution for installation should be done in wounds with a significant risk of infection if a biofilm is felt to be present or with gross infection. Analgesic installations of dilute lidocaine are extremely effective in managing the pain that may be associated with negative pressure wound therapy. The maximum dose of topical lidocaine is 3 milligrams per kilogram every two hours. Using lidocaine installation to manage wound pain, this is a patient that underwent a blow knee amputation. He had negative pressure therapy in place because there was a question whether he had adequate circulation to heal this wound. Some people have discomfort at uh, dressing changes. He had discomfort during the therapy itself. Using a very, very dilute uh, solution of lidocaine, about 5% of the maximum recommended dose. In this case, 25 cc's of 1% lidocaine plain, mixed in 20, 250 cc's of normal saline, and the patient had a greater than 70% decrease in pain medication uh, with this dilute lidocaine installation. Future considerations. The real future may be directed installation of specific solutions to accelerate the major phases of wound healing. In summary, negative pressure wound therapy is effective in inducing wound bed granulation tissue in patients with wounds. Wound cleansing plays an important role in wound bed preparation, and negative pressure wound therapy with installation has shown to be useful in the management of a variety of wound types. Thank you. This concludes my presentation. As a reminder, to receive continuing education credit following the conclusion of this activity, each participant must complete the post-test and evaluation, which can be easily completed online for immediate receipt of credit at www.centerforhealingsolutions.com. Thank you again for your participation.